I am joined here today with oh, sorry. I am joined here today with uh, Dr. Uh, Pete Bowers, who is the the brother of uh, Dr. Jeffrey Bowers. Um, Dr. Pete Bowers did his PhD uh, at Queen's University, which is uh, funny to me because my wife also went to Queen's University. Um, beautiful campus, by the way, and. Uh, he has spent his career specializing in um, structured word inquiry, which I believe is approach he himself coined the term for and, and invented, but I'll let him clarify that. He's nodding his head. So on, on that note, uh, normally with these podcast episodes, I don't do them visually, but uh, Dr. Bowers has requested that we do the um, interview visually. So I will be posting this up on the, the podcast, but I'm also going to post it up on YouTube and I'll share the link at the same time. Um, I think this is important to Dr. Bowers because there's a lot of uh, examples he wants to share visually. And I think he, he thinks it's better for a deeper understanding of this specific topic. Um, so I'll just post that in the link of the, the podcast episode if you're listening to this and you want to get that deeper understanding. Just to give a little bit of a deeper context, although any of our regular listeners I think are going to be at this point familiar. I recently hosted a debate with um, Dr. Bowers' brother, Dr. Bowers, and uh, uh, afterwards I, I had a little bit of engagement with his brother. Um, talking about um, the evidence of phonics, but in it, it came up where I was trying to summarize the debate response. Um, and in it, I, I characterized uh, SWI as phonics. Now, I think the, the primary reason Dr. Bowers was uh, wanting to engage in this debate is he, he believes that the level of con confidence that we as, as, uh, as an educated body in um, phonics instruction is blocking research into other types of uh, literacy instruction methods, such as SWI, which all things aside, I actually think is a perfectly fair and legitimate criticism of um, phonics. Uh, I don't want to see other ideas not being investigated. I'd love to see more studies on it. From what I can tell, it looks like we need more studies on this topic, actually. Um, but it, in my description of that, I described uh, SWI as a, an, a new form of phonics, essentially, that includes uh, morphology. Now, uh, both Dr. Pete Bowers and Dr. Jeffrey Bowers, I think, object to this um, characterization. So I wanted to give uh, Dr. Pete Bowers the chance to sort of explain it a little further um, and have a little conversation about this. And I have to admit, it's I've been uh, listening to um, Dr. Pete uh, in his um, seminars. I've been reading his research, and I still am a little confused as to how it's not a form of phonics. Um, and so... I do. I am really curious about that specific point, but that whole context aside, I actually think this is going to be really interesting to our, our listeners because what he's doing is very interesting. Um, and uh, all other contexts aside, too, I think um, Dr. Pete Bowers here is brilliant, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, he's. Uh, it's hard not to embarrass someone when you say something like that, but uh, I'm sure anyone who listens to him speak will very rapidly realize just uh, what an, uh, an intelligent person he is. Um, and I think his way of teaching is very interesting and fascinating and can ultimately present a new possible tool in the toolbox for any teacher. Um, so I'm, uh, without any further ado, I want to actually get into the questions. And I'm going to allow him the opportunity to introduce himself just in case I've butchered that or butchered the context around the situation. So Pete, as you've asked to be called, uh, please introduce yourself and say whatever you like at the start. All right. Well, yeah, so I'm Pete Bowers. Um... And I have been working with structured, this phrase structured word inquiry that we're addressing was the description of the instruction I did in my 2010 intervention with John Kirby. Um, that was the f first paper out of my PhD work, which was a vocabulary intervention with grade four, five students. And in which we found general vocabulary learning um, for the, the experimental group over the controls and what what I mean by general vocabulary learning is that we taught one group, two groups, and compared them to two other classrooms. And using this uh, instruction of the interrelation of morphology and phonology and etymology, um, to and see what effects we could find on vocabulary. And what we found was not only did kids improve on defining words that they were exposed to in that study, and in fact. Even that takes some clarification that in the course of that 20 sessions of that intervention, 
kids were potentially exposed to, I had to count them up, 420 words. <laughs> of it. Now, we did not teach 420 words explicitly, but when we look and see in a little bit these matrices, which are kind of boxes that hold morphemes in them that you can arrange into uh, related words in meaning and structure, but the pronunciation can change. And so what we found was, I like for example, I have a matrix in the first lesson on the word sign. And if you uh, look at that, when we look at that matrix, you could add a suffix like AL and all of a sudden you have signal or a DE prefix and now you have design or signature. And so you, you can see the relationships between these words. And we noticed that the pronunciation of that base, S-I-G-N, is changing. In design, we say sign. In, in signing, we say sign. And in signal, we say something like sign or something. And, and it's by looking at those words that we can understand why there's a G in the word sign because we need it for some of the pronunciations. But the point in terms of vocabulary was not only did kids get better at defining words that they were exposed to in that matrix, in that matrix, probably about 15 words they could have created out of that matrix. But I really only emphasized a small number of them to highlight the pronunciation changes and one suffixing change in the word signature. And But when we tested them after the case, like after the study, kids were better at defining words like significant that I had to not teach during the intervention in order to test that. So they were better at teaching words, at defining words that were related to words they were exposed to. They didn't improve on defining words that didn't share a base. Um, but the point there being it was general vocabulary learning, and that's really what vocabulary uh, interventions are looking for. How can we... We can't just teach kids every word they have to learn. So how can we teach kids such that they can become word learners? And we found evidence that this is something that can be done. And and it, this method was, was used. And I had to come up with a term to describe the instruction and the phrase I used was structured word inquiry. And just and we can talk a little bit more about that. But um, the, the reason for that phrase was as a, uh, as a classroom teacher, in teacher's college, and then I taught 10 years before I came back and started the grad work. And I had seen a lot of instruction that I thought was very problematic that was done in the name of inquiry. And the reason when that would be problematic is when this idea of inquiry led some, leads some teachers to think, well, you can't tell them too much. Well, yeah, you shouldn't tell them too much, but you got to tell them something. And, and the idea of, of structuring inquiry is you need the structures with which you can inquire. And so the, the, in, the, in, the create the, that process of inquiry, I think, is really valuable, but you have to guide it. It has to be structured. And so the phrase structure word inquiry is a play both on the idea that it's structured inquiry and it's structured inquiry about word structure. So that's the, that's the reason for the term. Um, there's a funny story about that. Uh, somebody wrote a piece in a, in a magazine one time. And the acronym SWI is, is what it's often referred to. And they referred to SWI as scientific word investigation. And somebody pointed me to the article. And I wrote to the person. I said, just so you know, it actually stands for structured word inquiry. But I'm bummed because I wish I was smart enough to think about the phrase scientific word investigation because that's a better description of what it is. I actually often say structured word inquiry is just scientific investigation of the written word, but that was too much of a mouthful, and I just wasn't smart enough to think about scientific word investigation. I, the, the, the only regret about structured word inquiry is that it sounds too much like a program, and it definitely is not a program. Um, so that I, I was t the way I came to it, though, I was teaching grade four. I'd been teaching for nine years. I was actually teaching in Indonesia, of all places, in an international school. A lot of my career teaching was overseas. And I was a terrible speller um, my whole life. Uh, and I'm, I've, I'm probably dyslexic myself. I've been, people in dyslexia centers have told me <laughs> they're very, they were very confident that I'm dyslexic. And I didn't struggle with learning to read. I don't have any trauma around that, but I'm still a slow reader, um, which is fine. But I was always a terrible speller and had very little interest in spelling instruction. Um, as a teacher, I'd never seen anybody excited about their spelling instruction or someone who felt really like they transformed kids who came in, who came in with a bad self-concept about their spelling or just were really bad at spelling. And then you did something and then they got better. Like that just didn't seem available 
to a spelling instruction. And it was all about this memorization and there's these exceptions and that drew no interest to me at all because I was very interested in, in, in inquiry-led instruction. Um, but uh, then I go to this conference and I see this character who makes this claim that English spelling makes perfect sense, is about meaning and doesn't have exceptions. And I thought, yeah, right. And f figured, and luckily for me, there was no other sessions at that same time that I was more need, felt I needed to go to. And so I wanted to go see the snake oil salesman that Real Spelling was the, the author of Real Spelling who was presenting. And within about five minutes, he'd made sense of so many spellings that had my brain had never been able to remember. And I just thought, that's crazy. And the point was happening was he was using these matrices that we'll look at shortly, where you could make sense of spellings that previous made no sense. I, I would not have known. And now I understood. And this was the thing. Um, he actually did one on the word really, and that had a, a particular uh, catch to me because not a couple of weeks before I went to this conference, I was going to write the word really in a book. And I was just in a kid's book, a homework book, they were on a contract or whatever. And I was trying to write, Johnny had a really good day. And I had to stop when I was writing really because I got to the R-E-A-L and I had to stop because I didn't know if it was one or two else. Mm. So, so think about how many times a teacher of, of nine years has encountered the word really in print by the time you've, you've reached that point in your career. And I still... It hasn't penetrated my orthographic memory so that I can write it automatically. I have to ask the question. And I look in the dictionary, I see it's got two L's, and I close the dictionary thinking, if I have to write that word tomorrow, I'm going to have the same question. This is the, this is the experience of we bad spellers, because it's like, obviously, looking at them hasn't done it for us. Right. And then I went and, and spoke to a librarian friend who just making fun of myself and said, you'll never believe it. I was trying to write the word really the other day and I didn't know if I had one or two L's. And she kind of rolls her eyes at me and says, oh, come on, Pete, of course it's two L's. It's real Lee. To which I say, well, how do I know it's real Lee? How come it's not real E? And she just shoves that under the rug, doesn't answer that. But see, she is thinking, what is going on with education that you could have a grade four teacher who doesn't know how to spell the word really if they were only taught in the way I was taught, you know, back in the day, we would have a better education system. All that's going through her head. But I would argue that she's making a classic error of causation and correlation. And that is that she was taught to syllabify words and all these, these very specific rules when she was growing up and she's a good speller. So I think she's assuming I must be an accurate speller because I was taught this way. And if you teach other people that old way, they'll be better spellers. Well, I would argue that actually, no, the reason she's a good speller is because she was born with a mind that has a good orthographic memory. And so she doesn't have to look at words that many times before she remembers how to spell them. And that also explains how she knows how to syllabify really into real Lee, because I, it's just as hard for me to remember to syllabify it real Lee or real E is it, is it to remember how many L's there are. <clears throat> but she knows how to syllabify because she has the spelling in her head. So she syllabifies between the two L's that are in the spelling in her head. And she's honestly thinking that it's the syllabifying that's helping her, but I think it's actually the other way around, that her orthographic memory helps her syllabify. And you can't teach me to have her brain. So when I was in this conference, uh, the um, presenter put the word real, R-E-A-L, up on the board. And um, then put a little line and put an L-Y suffix after it. And it was like, holy cow in one moment i knew i'd never have to look up that word again because i did know how to spell the word real which i had to do like it's a real nice day and i do know the ly suffix and all i needed someone to tell me was hey if you take that r-e-a-l and you put an l-y after it you have really and i have no thinking that you drop l's so once i understood how really was spelled i knew i'd never have to look in a dictionary and that was a new experience because I was understanding I wasn't being taught to memorize. And the, the more exciting, the more, and then you get other words like realist and unreal and surreal and, oh my God, surreal. Now it's got two R's because the prefix has an S-U-R. But then the really big one was when you added the I-T-Y. So what do you get if you add R-E-A-L and an I-T-Y? Now you get reality. 
Now that's the one that really hit me because all of a sudden, ah, it's this interrelation. That's going to be the watchword all the way through today. It's the interrelationship of the morphology and the phonology that allowed me to understand the graphene phoneme correspondences. Because the word reality, you couldn't spell like it's homo the word real, like a fishing reel, as an R, R double E L. Well, you can't use the double E in a base to write reality, but the R E A would made more sense. And so that kind of that was the opening, you know, my opening to this work. Went back to my grade four classroom, started working with it. It was the end of the school year, and I was already excited about what the kids were doing. And then the next year, taught with this real spelling resource, and it just turned everything I'd ever seen upside down. I was uh, kids were fighting over dictionaries. We were investigating words. We were emailing with this character. We'd come up with questions that I didn't know the answer to. We were working with this reference, and we we were just all learning together. And it just my. My wife was teaching grade three. My, uh, Lynn Anderson, who's one of the world leaders in teaching young kids, was teaching grade one at the time, and it just overtook what we did. And so I came back to and I came back to Canada, to Kingston, where I am on Wolf Island near Kingston now, and um, I was trying to explain this work to to people, and I wasn't getting much interest. And one of the questions that I got, I remember going talking to a principal friend of mine and saying, "Hey, I want to show you what I've been doing." And we worked with, I, I'm sure I explained words like sign and rough and love and does and, and such by explaining how they worked. And it was, oh, that's very cool. That's because all of a sudden they understood them. But then the first question she asked was, what does the research say? And it was a kind of a question that, you know, surprised me in part because I had no idea. I had never investigated the research side of what I was excited about in this in that that year, um, but the other reason I was surprised is that you know I'm I've obviously gotten involved in the research and I'm interested in the research, but what I didn't understand is if if a child had asked that kid how is why is does spelled that way if a child had asked that question to the principal five minutes before I came, all they could say is that's you know that's an irregular word you got to memorize. But now, after like 10 minutes, she could explain the spelling of does. And what I couldn't understand is, what, why would I need to wait for evidence from research if the choice I have is between asking a kid to memorize the spelling of does or understand the spelling of does? To me, that I don't need to wait until somebody else tells me which is better because I would argue understanding is a instruction which builds understanding is going to be more effective than instruction that's based on rote memory, especially for dyslexics who show we're really bad at memorizing spellings of words. But I also realized that the the question wasn't really for her, but if you're a principal in a public school and you wanted to have Pete come in and do some PD, the first question you're going to get is, what does the research say? And so it, I realized I'm not going to get very far if I can't answer that question. And so I ended up doing the master's with John Kirby, who was also the uh, my supervisor for the PhD, which I had not expected to do, but there it is. And since then, I've been doing this this work and um, working with teachers and kids around the world. So that was probably a longer story than you needed, but <laughs> that's no, it. That was all really interesting. I think actually you and I are going to run into a problem in that I am a talker, you're a talker, <laughs> and I have a lot of questions. So, yeah. um, but that's okay. Uh, let me know if you run out of time though, and we we can tap out. But, uh, uh, you know, there's a couple of things that just really stood out there to me. And some of this, I think, actually, I was thinking about when I was reading your paper today, you talked about this idea of not really liking the existing structure of language instruction and just thinking, I, I got to reinvent it and sort of come up with my own framework. Um, and although I haven't done a PhD, I, I've sort of did the same thing with math instruction in my classroom. And I've been, I, I've done a lot of talking about it on this podcast, but um, and it was sort of this, just the same idea. It was like, I didn't really like how math was taught. I was a terrible math student. Well, I thought it was uh, terrible math. And now math is my favorite, my favorite yeah, subject to teach. Yeah. Um, but I, I think there is something to approaching, um, coming up with an idea from the ground up rather than from building on an old bad idea. Uh, mm -hmm. 
I'm losing my train of thought here. So I'll, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll move on but, to something before we get. But just, just before you do, there's something that I, I just respond to that, that um, I, I totally take what you're saying, but please don't think that I'm making anything up. I haven't invented anything. I'm, I'm building on the work I saw from real spelling, but real spelling hasn't invented anything either. There, he, the, the author is a, a linguist who understood how English orthography worked. And so this is the issue. This is what structured word inquiry is. It's just, a re, it's just a response. It's just a, it's an approach to instruction. It just emphasizes explicit instruction about how our English orthography system works. So I'm not inventing anything, but what it, what's striking, it feels like it's all new because it's not what's done in schools. But actually, um, it, this is understanding that's long been in linguistics. Um, you know, if you talk, you know, you can find famous quotes from people like Noam Chomsky and stuff. Thing the spelling is near optimal. But the point is, it's it makes sense when you understand that it's the interrel. It represent the spelling system represents an interrelationship of morphology, etymology, and phonology. And so, if you don't teach that way. If, if the instruction doesn't reflect that, then you end up having a description of spellings that often falls apart. But what we do is we call those exceptions, as opposed to recognizing, actually, nobody writes a science paper and they, they say, here, I've explained the data, and here's my graph, and here's, the, here's the, the points on the line, and here's a few outliers. They don't say those outliers. They don't call them exceptions. Right, the out you, can, you have to account for the outliers, right? But what we do and talk about spelling is say, well, here's the here's the pattern of how spelling works, and then you get a word like does, and you say, well, it doesn't follow the pattern, therefore it's an exception. Actually, the fact that the spelling of does doesn't follow our hypothesis of how spelling works, that's actually that word does is a falsification of how we've been thinking it works. I, I will I will say that. Um... There, there was a real key take point, point I had from the, the debate between Dr. Your brother, I should say, and Dr. Carforth, um, which is irrelevant to this discussion, to be fair. Mm -hmm. but, um, there's a, a key takeaway point I took from your lecture that I attended the other day, and that was that our language is more based off morphology than phonology. Um, and I wasn't even really aware of it. I'd never even really thought about morphology. In fact, I'll tell you just a quick little anecdote. Um, the first time I interviewed Dr. Garforth, um, she brought up uh, morphology as a part of systematic phonics instruction. And I think mm. my eyes probably glazed over a little bit because I thought it was such a boring topic. Um, and uh, when I heard uh, your brother talking about it, I thought, hey, these guys are saying the same thing. They, they really they agree with each other. Um, and I've come to realize that, no, there's a, there's a difference there that I wasn't aware of um, upon further examination. But um, I don't know. I, I think it's just it's not something we talk a lot about in education. But before we really go any further, because I, I feel like most of my listeners are probably not going to know a lot of these terms we're using. So I was yeah. wondering if you could just define some of these base terms for the listeners so that they know what we're talking about. Yeah. And so and and let, let's um, let's do this by looking at some um, orthography. And I knew that a particular issue here it has to do with understanding the relationship of phonics and what we do in structured word inquiry. So just before we get to the, 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 those ter the terminology that we're using, here's the, the, and we'll, we'll, the, the basic point is this, is that, and I'll show, it, I'll show a definition, of, of, a recent definition of phonics instruction that I think is totally um, representative of what I've, been, I've read for definitions of phonics. And the key point that I would make is, in phonics instruction, every published definition I've ever seen, it's talking about association between graphemes and phonemes, and you can go to higher higher levels of onsets and rhymes, and you could talk about syllables and such. But I've yet to see a published definition of phonics that mentions the influence of morphology or etymology on grapheme choice. So that's why I use the phrase isolated phonics in that article you're talking about to describe what is typically called either phonics instruction or systematic phonics instruction. And the reason I say isolated phonics is because it does act, it does something really valuable and important. It teaches kids and teachers what are the available grapheme phoneme correspondences. And we'll talk about those terms, grapheme and phoneme, more in a second. So that's a crucial thing to do. 
But my problem as a speller growing up wasn't that I didn't know what those were. It was that I didn't know when to choose them. So with the word really, from the pronunciation, there was nothing I could do that would tell me how many L's to put in the word. The only way I could know that I need two L's was to think about the, the, the word real that I was treating as a base and an L-Y suffix. And it was the suffix L-Y added to a base or what I thought was a base, R-E-A-L, that tells me why there's two L's. It's not a phonological explanation. Phonology is involved when I say, oh, I can't write it with a P. So I had to, I knew that you, you're going to use an L, but I didn't know how many to use. And the answer to that question wasn't going to be resolved by isolated phonics. I needed someone to make a morphological connection to a word like real and really. And similarly, I couldn't explain why the word, how do I know which real I want? The R-E-E-L or the R-E-A-L? Well, the fishing reel and the movie reel, all those reel have something to do with turning. They're unrelated to the other real. There's no meaning connection. But you can't use the double E to, to write the word reality. And the word reality is related to the word real for a real nice day. So the, the point that I want to make that distinguishes how we teach grapheme phoneme correspondence in structured word inquiry from phonics is that what I describe how we teach grapheme phoneme correspondence in structured word inquiry is orthographic phonology. And we'll come back to this. It's, it's not only what are the available grapheme phoneme correspondences, but how do they work in the orthography system? And so that's why I can't say that we teach phonics in structured word inquiry. The problem is people equate the term phonics with grapheme phoneme correspondence instruction, as if that's the only way to teach it. So if you, if you hear that, wait a second, they don't teach phonics, that's crazy. You got to teach the grapheme phoneme correspondences. This, no, we have, yes, we have to teach them, but we have restricted our awareness of how they're teachable. As if, so what I'm trying to make a very clear distinction between how we teach graphing phony correspondences in SWI versus phonics. So that's that difference. And the other difference is structured word inquiry isn't, neither is it morphological instruction. It's orthographic it's instruction. It's the instruction of the system. So let, let's take a little look at, at, at that specific idea, which will help us get into some of these terms. So I want to look at this idea of this orthographic phonology term that I just mentioned and how is it related or not related to phonics. So there's, the, as I've been mentioning, there's a, a, a the orthography system, and we're talking about English right now, but this is probably a, applicable to most orthography systems, is that it represents meaning, right? That, that its primary job is the representation of the meaning of words to those who already know and speak the language. One of the ways through which that meaning is represented is through orthographic phonology. So when we talk about graphing phoneme correspondences, phonemes have to do are related to meaning. They're minimal distinctive units of speech that can affect meaning. So we are that's part of the story. But what we what we learn in this in this diagram that I can describe a little bit is that there's a the model shows that there's an interrelationship between the morphology, the etymology, and and the phonology. And they're marked as interrelated. Now, this, di this diagram is from real spelling, but it, it's just reflecting long ideas in, in uh, linguistics. So I have a quote here from Vinetsky in 1999. English orthography is not a failed phonetic transcription system invented out of madness or perversity. Instead, it's a more complex system which preserves bits of history, i.e. etymology, facilitates understanding, which really invokes the morphology with the, as the meaning structure, and also translates into sound. So that's, that is, this is just, this model is just a reflection of what the writing has already long been understood. And then the question we can ask is, how is that understanding of the orthography system reflected in instructional practice? Now, if we understand that in linguistics, it's not a failed transcription system with all these exceptions, that's kind of interesting compared to how we talk about it in schools a lot, where we really base this the instruction on the alphabetic principle and the idea that the primary job of alphabetic letters is to represent the sounds of words, but there's many exceptions. 
so here, and, uh, you know, Brian Byrne just as I could put a, a zillion of, of quotes about this inconsistencies and irregularities in English spelling abound. Nevertheless, English is fundamentally an alphabetic language. The question is, what do we mean by an alphabetic language? Yes, it has an, we have an alphabet and we use those letters to write things. But the implication is, is that the primary job of letters is to write sounds without reference to how those grapheme phoneme correspondences are, ref, are influenced by the morphology and etymology. So I'm arguing those inconsistencies aren't actually inconsistencies in the system. That's what you get when you misrepresent the system. If you think of it spelling as a sound, a sound representation system, and you can't, then you find out that you have these exceptions. And here's the quote I mentioned that I'll just read since not everybody can see, but here's just a, a very, I think, re reflective definition of phonics instruction from Jennifer Buckingham in 2020. The term systematic phonics describes practices for teaching, decoding, and word reading. It teaches students the correspondences between graphemes, letters and letter clusters, in written words and phonemes, speech sounds, in spoken words, and how to use these grapheme phonic correspondences to read and spell. Phonics instruction is systematic when it teaches the major grapheme phonic correspondences in a planned sequence. I think it's a totally represented definition of phonics. And like every other published definition, it doesn't tell me that if I want to understand which grapheme to use for a given phoneme, I can get a lot of help by looking at morphology and etymology. So what we have is a disconnect between how linguists describe orthography and how we're describing it in schools. And as a scientist, that's where you dig. So let me, let me I'll do my best to articulate this for your, your audio listeners, but what I'm doing is I wanna talk about this idea of this, what I'm describing as orthographic phonology. So here's a word, we have the word act, like I, you, somebody could act out, they're a good actor, I'm acting. And so I have this ACT base in the center in bold as the base. And then I had suffixes like ING and ION and OR, R -E -S -S -S, so I can have actress and active and all that. So we, we, we take those words. One key point in terms of morphology is in, in morphology is we have bases and affixes. So the, every word you'll ever meet is either a base or a base with something fixed to it. You cannot have a word that doesn't have a base. It might just be a base with nothing else, in which case it's called a free base. Like the word act is a base because it, it, you can't go any deeper. You can't analyze anything off it, but it's also free to be a word. And, but if I take the ing, I get the word acting. Now we can look at that word and we can see um, this T grapheme, I put in angle brackets that signals, the angle brackets signal what's inside is orthographic. We use this with kids and it's a, explain this as well. And so that's a T. You name the thing here in the angle brackets by its letter name. In this case, we're using that T for the T grapheme because we're associating it with the T phoneme, which I mark with these slash brackets, which is how you mark phonological information. And that's the default job of the T in take and tell and bat and all sorts of words, the T grapheme writes t. But something interesting happens when we add the ION. And now we have the word action. So now, uh, Nate, if I gave you the word actor, I, I hope you don't mind. I'm just gonna, it's help, this stuff helps if I use you as kind of a, Interlocutor, as people say. So say the, say the word actor for me. Actor. How do you pronounce the base in the word actor? Act. Say action for me. Action. How do you pronounce the base in the word action? Well, let me let me try doing this a little slower. I see, because I, I know where you're getting it, but I want to make sure I'm 100% accurate. In this yeah. Story. Action. See, I, I, I know, I feel like if I say it really fast, it sounds like I'm saying act shin like sh in and i feel like that's what you're getting at but in my head i don't feel like i'm saying that in my head i feel like i'm saying act oh you know what if i can't do it you're right but you know what you did that was awesome say act act now what do you feel at the end i feel my tongue hitting the roof of my mouth. your tongue touches the top of your mouth when you go t just say t t and oh be careful because you don't say act unless you're you're saying actor no no uh, at the end just say t 
There you go. So we say at, your tongue touches the top of your mouth and you go t, which is why when we teach graphing phonic correspondences, we're very explicit about what do you feel which is what speech and language pathologists do because it's much easier and I loved it. You were just, you just did it. You felt the difference between t and sh because when you say action, your tongue doesn't touch the top of your mouth. Mm -hmm. And that's a difference you can feel and we're so good at convincing ourselves of what we hear that we can, we can override it but when we attend to what we feel, we see the difference. Now here's the other part of that story. You're also misled in thinking about the ak shun because when you say ak shun, you're thinking in syllables. And we're not talking about syllables here. The base in the word action, well, the ION is pronounced un in action. Un. The base the base ACT is pronounced aksh in action. The T is writing the sh. Now Let's say, and I'll give you evidence for that because I know that most people don't know about this, but the idea that we're doing here is that in phonics, we can teach the graphing phoneme cor we teach the graphing phoneme correspondence in isolation. If we did actually teach that the T can write sh and it turns out this is the case if there's an I or U after it, it can do that. It can also write t like in acting, but the T will only write sh if there's an I or U after it. That's what I'm, I'm claiming. Now, Let's say we taught that in phonics. Well, then I can write action with an SH or with a T. How do I choose which? If I've made the misspelling A-C-S-H-U-N as a kid and I ask my teacher, why is that wrong? What could you tell me? Yeah, I'm going to be honest. If a kid came up to me and said, why is it wrong? I wouldn't have a good answer. Well, now look at this matrix and tell me why. Well, I, I can see that it, because act is the root word in... It, so it's, it, it's, it's, the ba it's the base word. We're going to reserve root for historical things, base for oh, okay. morphological. But that's no, that's the, that's an attested use of the word. You didn't do anything wrong, but I'll explain why we do differ, why why we do that differently here. But the point being that the base of actor and acting and action and active and react and in reaction is ACT. And so one of the practices we do in SWI is we don't refer to morphemes by a pronunciation because that pronunciation changes. We refer to them by their spelling, which is another way of fixing the spelling in our heads. By spelling them out, we are actually helping build the orthographic representation in our minds. So the base of action is ACT, and the base of acting is ACT. And the reason we need the AC, we can't spell action with an SH, we're gonna see in a second. So what we're looking for is the best grapheme phony correspondences, not for a single word, but in how they fit in the family. And so what we, in orthographic phonology and phonics, we can compare these two. Again, I'm gonna describe a little bit for your, your listening audience instead of the video audience, um, but hopefully it should all make sense, that both orthographic phonology and phonics explicitly teach what are the available graphing phony correspondences and that's a good thing for both absolutely but what orthographic phonology does that isn't in the deaf defined versions of phonics is it teaches how they operate in the orthography system and so what we end up doing when we teach phonics is we pull this phonology part out of the system and try to teach it in isolation and that brings problems, like our act-action story. So when we looked at, at this, the SH can't be used in this word because the SH can write the SH phoneme, but it can't write the T phoneme that we have in act. What we actually need is we need the spelling of the base that can represent any of its pronunciations. And Carol Chomsky told us actually in 1970 that children could be productively introduced to the fact that a morpheme doesn't have a pronunciation until it's in a word. And so this practice that we're doing is not new to real spelling, but we're building it on stuff that Carol Chomsky suggested in 1970. Now, something that often comes up in, in a phonics kind of uh, approach is people often teach the TI digraph because they've noticed a lot of words where you have a TI and you say shh, and so they think that so they present that as a digraph so action would be spelled with a ti station would be spelled with a ti and so 
Now, you, it doesn't explain how do you know that you use TI instead of SH or whatever. Um, but when we actually look at the morphology now, we realize that the word action has the base ACT and a suffix ION, and station has the base STATE for state. A steady state, it's in the same station, stationary. And so it turns out station has an ION suffix too. It just happens that that vowel suffix replaces the, the what I call the final non-syllabic E, single silent E, same idea. So when we look at this words, now we get to learn something really crucial that I don't, I've yet to see taught in, in isolated phonics. And that is graphemes only ever happen within morphemes. You cannot have a digraph with one letter in the base and another letter in the suffix, which means that it's not possible for there to be a TI digraph in action or station, as is often taught. In fact, this idea is so ingrained in our way of thinking about things that my Oxford English Dictionary lists the suffix T-I-O-N. And it says it's a suffix forming nouns of action or condition, and the example words it gives are completion and relation. It's worth noting the origin note that from Latin parcel stems ending in T with an I-O-N, which is signaling it's not a T-I-O-N. So if we accepted the Oxford's definition of completion and relation as words that have an I-O-N suffix, we'd have to think that the base is complete, of complete, of completion, or relay. That's obviously not the case. What we have is complete with an I-O-N suffix replacing the E and relate with an I-O-N suffix replacing the E, and that means there's no T I there. In fact, I've yet to see a T-I um, digraph anywhere because whenever you see a T with an I after it and you, and you recognize that pronunciation, shh, you'll find that there's a plus sign between it. And just to make sure that I'm not cherry picking here, the definition of suffix in the same Oxford is a morpheme added to the end of a word. You aren't adding T-I-O-N to anything here. And notice, um, Nate, how you thought about that word, action. If you think action when you're working at the word action, you're likely to not notice the link to the word act. I often ask teachers, have you ever taught your students that to ask a question is literally to go on a quest for knowledge? I had never taught that. I'd never noticed that until I started working with these word sums where you analyze the morphemic elements in a word into their morphemes and see how they fit together, see how the suffixing changes happen, see how the pronunciation changes happen, and how these meaning building blocks like Lego pieces build the word. Well, it had never occurred to me that Q-U-E-S-T is the base of question. Because if I have the T-I-O-N in my head that I'm taught as a structure, I don't see the quest. And if I, when I say question, I don't say quest. The base is pronounced quest with what is called a CH sound. Now imagine being a student with phrases like the CH sound, the T sound, the, the, you know, the SH sound. Well, why would I put a, 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 why wouldn't I spell jumped with a T at the end? It's got the T sound. Well, the thing is, we don't teach that in structured work. We would never use the, we avoid phrases where you name sounds by letter names because it doesn't help. We can talk about the phoneme and the grapheme, and then we can talk about, oh, what do you feel at the end of jump? Do you feel that? T oh, but look at that. It's not written with a T. Oh, we have the base, J-U-M-P. And what did we fix at the end? Oh, it's an E-D suffix. And now we can look at how you pronounce the E-D suffix. Now, that is often taught in other schools. I know that many people who teach in phonics programs talk about the three pronunciations of the E-D suffix, and that's awesome. My point is, the E-D suffix isn't special. It's like all morphemes, they don't have pronunciations until they're in a word. And what happens is every once in a while in a, in a generally phonics-based program, some morphological bits pop in there and that's awesome. But it's not the definition of phonics because the definition of phonics that any published definition I've seen never references the interrelationship of morphology and etymology for grapheme choice. If you do it here and there, great, but why not? Understand that is the organizing principle of the whole writing system. So you've, you've left me about a thousand questions here, but uh, uh, I just, I want to first off, just acknowledge something that I think you've really proven extensively. And I tried to preemptively justify this, but I think there's a better point to place it after your explanation. 
I think you've very adequately proven that language, the English language is more complicated than the phonological understanding of it. And that this is an oversimplification of it to look at the English language as phonological. I, you've, you've sold me on this point. Um, but then to me, then what we, the question, not all the questions I have that come up with this are, what do we do with this information? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so let, let's, let's, let's break into this a little bit, but first I want to talk about a little bit going back to like, is SWI phonics, I guess for me, just as a colloquial understanding as a teacher, and I will make the caveat that I am not, um, in the camp of a very specific phonological instructor. I'm not a linguist. Um, in fact, this year I'm teaching kindergarten gym, which is ironic. It's not really my, my forte, but, um, you know, my, my understanding of phonics was always just teaching the sounds of language, the sounds of letters, the sounds of, um, digraphs, the sounds of syllables that, and as you call it, that graphene phenological connection. Um, although I've never called it that myself before, um, or graphene pho phoneme correspondence stories, what you were calling it. Um, but you, you're still teaching graphene, phoneme, yes. you're, you're, you're adding something else to it, right? You're making your, it's, it's more complete look at language for sure. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, that's still, I guess I've always thought of phonics as just the teaching of that. So when you add something else into it, this is you might really put more of the morphology or the orth orthographical approach to it, but you're still including that original, what I would have understood. This phonics. is, and this is exactly the point is that for so long, the only instructional phrase associated with teaching graphene phonic correspondences is, is the word phonics. Now, phonics isn't a linguistic term. Linguists don't talk about phonics because they're not teaching the writing system. They talk about phonology, morphology, etymology, and, and all this. But the thing is, there is a qualitative difference between teaching about graphene phonic correspondences over here and teaching about morphemes over here. And what we do in structured word inquiry, which is how we teach their interrelationship. So lots of people say to me, but phonics doesn't say you can't teach morphology. And I never said it did. What I'm saying is there's a qualitative difference between understanding graphing phoneme correspondences and how they interact in a system than to take these things and isolate them and teach them over here. And, and that's why we end up with these words that people call irregular, because you're not teaching the interrelationship. It's, it's, an ex, it's maybe a bit far of an analogy, but it it's, gets to the point. The, the comparison I would make is that if you want to teach kids about what water is, you can't teach about hydrogen over here and oxygen over here and think you've taught them about water. It's the H2O that makes water that has its characteristics and stuff. There's hydrogen and there's oxygen and they're involved in, in water, but you can't claim to have taught what water is by taking its elements out, studying them, and then letting the kid put them together on their own later. And we, and I'll, we'll get to the research soon that help ex are, why there's evidence about why teaching about morphology actually brings benefits to the phonological learning because it makes sense of it. But this is the key thing. I cannot use, I, I, I can't say that structured word inquiry teaches phonics because phonics definitionally in the research doesn't make reference to the influence of morphology and etymology. And I think it's such a qualitative difference that we need new language so that we understand that difference. Fair, fair I'll, so, I'll, give you, I'll give you one more example along these lines that's just a classic um, to, to see this idea, like the spelling of does. And so somebody might write it with a D-U-Z. Well, it's got the Z sound which we shouldn't call the Z sound. You know what the most common way to write the Z sound is? The S. It's absurd to call it the Z sound. It's true word initially, you can only use the Z for Z. But in general, if you have a Z in a word, the most likely case is written with an S graphene. So having Z sound in your head, for the, for the kid who has a good orthographic memory, they see the word does enough times, they read it enough times, they know how to spell does, they go D-O-E-S, they don't think about it. But if you have a difficulty with remembering spellings, and therefore you don't have an automated spelling in your head, then you rely on what you're taught. And if you're going to write does, and you write the sound letter correspondence you've taught, you might, you'd like to go D-U-Z. 
So you successfully apply what you're taught and you get it wrong. And then you're told, oh, that's an irregular word. You're going to have to memorize it. That is the part that isn't true. There's nothing weird about the O of does writing a. Uh. It does the same thing in sun and love and come. No problem. And, and, if, um, and so now when we look at the structure of this, ah, we can see the word does. I do my work. She does her work. And then I can see, oh, does doing done are all related. And then we can take a look and say, wait a second, I don't know, is any really a suffix? Well, if you look at a parallel family, goes, going, gone, this makes sense. And again, the same idea, morphemes don't have pronunciations until they learn words, so it's fine that they change pronunciation. Does is following English conventions to the T. And yet we teach it as irregular when I can understand why it's spelled with a D-O because I need that D-O to spell the word do and the word doing. And that links all of these words together. I can't spell it with a Z because there's no suffix Z. It turns out to be the E-S suffix in this word. And so if we have this, if we can explain such words, then I would say there's no question in my mind that we will help kids more if they, if if they can see that they're studying a system that they might not know everything right now, but you can learn how the graphing phonic correspondences work and how it links to meaning. And, and over time, compared to being told, here's a big pile of irregular words just you're going to have to memorize. How many kids are excited about that as opposed to understanding? Well, I, I think you make a really compelling argument as to why. And I, I, I think tying this into some of the research on dyslexia in particular, okay. Um, a lot of people, you know, talk about the, the fact the benefit of phonics is rather than having kids memorize the words, we're explicitly explaining the reason the words are spelled the way they are with phonics. And you're sort of adding another component to this, I believe. And I would argue that actually this is one, I would argue that it's just as reasonable to think of structured word inquiry as a novel form of graphing phonic correspondence as it is a novel form of morphological instruction in which we can offer dyslexics better understanding of how graphing phonic correspondences work. So you, you completely sold me on the why. So okay. let's let's start to look at the execution and in, in with the questions if, if you don't if you don't mind. Absolutely. I'm just checking because I'm plugged in, but there doesn't seem to be power in this socket. So I'm going to make sure that I get plugged in before we start. <laughs> oh, okay, sure. Um, and you can just you can ask your question. I'll hear it. Okay, sure. I'm just going back to our, my my questions here. So um, before we we move any further though along, I I want us to look at. Um, how you're teaching this at different grade levels to me, because uh, this is a, you know, a question that came up from a member of the audience. I, I talked to a couple of people saying I was going to be interviewing you. And um, one of the questions came up with, well, how do you teach SWI if the students don't already have a basic level of phonemic um, understanding? Um, so do you, and my, my understanding of this is, you know, personally, I'll give you just to give an example of how I would teach, so, you know, say a student is in kindergarten, I'm going to be focusing on um, letters and then the very basic sounds of letters, sort of like um, a synthetic approach to phonics in the sense that I want them to understand, but just that, that very basic, you know, like T to type thing. And I probably wouldn't get to get too much into um, uh, digraphs, for example. Now, when you're teaching at that very base level, are you doing yeah. something similar or are you doing something more? So I'll, 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 let's look at that exact question. And before we do, one thing I need to highlight is this is the one area that I know there's lots of controversy around structured word inquiry. Is um, there? I'm not aware of that, to be honest. Well, I mean, this is the, 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 the controversy is the letter sound correspondences. There's actually no research evidence for that, I would argue. Um, I would argue there's actually not even a logical argument for it. It's just that it, it's, it's so much how we've looked at the world, it's hard to look at it another way. Um, so let me show you an example. I'm, I'm afraid I'm in a room that seems to have the power off, so I may have to move at some point, but I'm, we'll go for, I'll let you know when we're getting close. Okay. And we can, I can go to another space and we can start again. So here's a, a, a book um, that I was using tutoring a kid. And this was a kid I was working with who, when I started, I discovered in the first session, he was not even, he was probably naming letters accurately about 70% of the time. So he's okay. identified as dyslexic, he's not reading, he's in grade one, 
And so I start working with this kid and his mom. And one thing we get to do is I, we, I look for books that he enjoys. This was one book that we did later, but I just had, had an access and I, this is written by a friend so I can show it. <laughs> so let's say we're reading this story about this character, <coughs> um, Dr. Peanut. So I go through and read the text. It says, get ready to meet the smallest doctor in the world. Get set to meet Dr. Peanut. He's waiting for you to say hello. All right, so I've just read this, but if you're watching, you can see how I've pulled this box down. So we're both looking at the text at the same time. And now we can go in here and I can say, hmm, I just noticed this word here, get ready to meet the smallest doctor. What does that mean, smallest? And the kid, the kid will know what the word means. Oh, so he's the smallest doctor. There's a picture there. He's so small, he's smaller, he's about the, he's smaller than that guy's shoe. Excellent. So let's, could you spell the word smallest for me? And if he couldn't, I would spell it. Okay, it's spelled like this, S-M-A-L-L-E-S-T. Say smallest for me. And then I can say, well, what do you, what does it mean small? Oh, it means that he's smaller than, oh, smaller. I could talk about the word S-M-A-L-L-E-R. Or I could just, Talk about S M A L L. So small, smaller, smallest. Oh, the reason he's smallest is because he's smaller than somebody else, smaller than everybody. Now, those are all words that the kid has in his oral language. And all I'm doing is highlighting the orthographic structures in the words that he knows in his oral language. Now we can look here at the and call this the base, S M A L L. And notice by spelling this base, I don't think this base changes his pronunciation anywhere but I still spell it out. And by doing that, I'm getting him used to the letter names. I'm, I'm doing that, but notice I'm always saying double L. And I get him to spell it that way. And I could say, say small. What do you feel at the beginning of small? You feel that S. How do you think you write S in small? With the S. What do you feel after that? Mm. Ah, your lips are touching. Mm. Ah, that, that M is writing the M. Mm. And then you have the A for the A ah, and the double L is writing O. Oh. Okay. So I, could, I, can ta I can introduce you to these graphing phony correspondences in whatever word you picked, but I picked smallest here for a reason. I might even say this. There's, it's, there, here's an, now I'm not saying this is the first session and I always get into trouble with this because I'm gonna show you where you can go. I'm not, I might, that might be more than I even did. I might've just picked that word or let's, before I get myself into trouble by going farther, let's talk about a word like, I just wanna find as, I'm looking for the word the, oh, there we go. Here's the word the. Can you spell that word for me? Do you mean me right now? Yep. Yeah. Sure, T-H-E. I spell it a little differently. I spell it T-H-E. Can you spell it that way for me, Nate? T-H-E. And so I'm giving one tap for the T-H and one for the E. Why do you suppose, and I'm, t I'm talking to a kid now who might not know the names of these letters yet, but they can repeat it. Right, and they're looking at the at the spelling that I just did, and I'm making him tap out T H and the E, and once he's done that, I can say, "Why do you suppose I put the T H together, not the H and the E?" And he, if he doesn't know, say, "Well, say the." He says the. Well, what do you feel at the beginning? Th. How do you think you write the th in the? And because I've already given the scaffolding of announcing T H multiple times. He's going to understand that it's the TH writing the th and the E's writing the uh. Okay. And I can, I could go off and if I want to, I could do a lesson on a whole bunch of words with THs or I could just make that just a little signal and then we get, maybe get into smallest or something like that. I might even at some point, maybe not today, but maybe come back to a word like artist. Say artist for me. Artist. Do you notice the difference? How do you pronounce that I-S-T suffix in artist? Est. And how do you pronounce it in smallest? Est. Exactly the same. But notice they're not spelled the same. How come I have an I-S-T for artist, but an E-S-T for smallest? I have no idea. Well, what does an I-S-T mean? What is an artist? An artist is somebody who does art. The I-S-T is a suffix that is, it tells you the person does that thing. Whereas the EST isn't talking about somebody who does small. It's saying it's smaller than everything. It's the smallest. 
So we get to, again, highlight how the pronunciations, you can't tell from sound how to write that suffix. You have to actually tie a meaning to it. That's, that's and in the process... Point. Oh, and in the process, and that's why I said, now be, be aware that I'm not saying this is lesson one. Yeah. But lesson one could have been with the, and could have been with cat and cats. And we can teach the graphing phoning correspondences at the same time that we are introducing kids to words. Now, here's an example story. That kid that I was working with, who was just learning to name some, still learning to name some letters when I started, he got very interested in finding ing suffixes. And then suffixes in general, because we would stop and notice them. And once you notice something, once you spell something out, so we found an EST there linking to, and, and, and with that. But here we got waiting. Hmm. He's, he's waiting. Oh, I could wait for you to say so, hello, or I can say he is waiting. Okay. So I guess we have a base there, W-A-I-T. What do you think the suffix is? And they're looking at the text, so they can now say ing, or I would tell them it's an ing. I get them. To, I get to say. I get them kids to say suffixes and quick and prefixes quickly. Ing and ure and ly and pre by announcing them together quickly. I'm building them as representations in their mind that they're easier to notice. Now that we've seen ings, now when we re when I read the next part of the story, he starts to notice other ings. And so what happens is we start to make a morpheme chart at home. So we have bases and, and prefixes and suffixes. And his favorite thing got to be finding new suffixes. So he and his mom would go on suffix hunts during between our sessions. And he kept adding to his morpheme chart. And maybe about the fourth or fifth session I was working with him, he's got like 20 suffixes on his board. And when we're reading books that he likes, we keep noticing them. And if we hit one I think is probably new, I said, hey, do you, Charlie, do we have one of those suffixes yet? No. And he runs over to the board to put it up there. And one time he he's determined to tell me all the suffixes he's now got there because he's found so many on his own with his mom. And so he's naming those suffixes. Guess what he has to do to name the suffixes? He has to spell them all out. So he spells out like 20 suffixes. And not only spells them out, he spells them out quickly. I-N-G, U-R-E, L-Y. And at the end of that session, I talk to the mom and say, have you noticed the utter transformation in Charlie's ability to name letters? And she just laughs because he, she and her teacher had noticed this change dramatically. Why? Well, guess what? He couldn't name letters when we start all the letters when he started. But why was he better? Because I gave him a reason to look inside words and notice those letter names because they were attached to meaningful structures that he got interested in. So he had a reason to practice naming the letters. Now, I'm not going to say that's how it happens with every kid. But the point is, the idea that I should stop teaching him graphing phoning correspondence or morph, morpholo, morphology because he doesn't know all his letters yet would not have been a good idea in that kid's case. That was one of the things that got him to look at words and look at the spellings of words and the names of letters. And when we when he spells out words, he's for when we now we get on announce the graphemes in the base. So when we get to words, he would spell them out and he would often self-correct. So he might go T E A T E A C H because because it's become a new prompt to find the graphemes. So he's looking for them, and you can't know to announce a grapheme like a ch unless you attend it, you link it to the phoneme in your head. The ch. The only way to know to put the ch together is because you've seen it before and you know it links to the phoneme you just said. So in the the loud and the writing out loud and the tapping out of structure. It demands that teachers, if you follow those recommendations, that you are reflecting morphological and even etymological structures that we haven't explained yet, and uh, phonological structures. Every time you do the word sum, which is like the most basic tool in structured word inquiry, there's absolutely no loss of attention to graphing phonic correspondences. You get tons of practice. Okay, so that, that's really fascinating. I really enjoyed that, that talk and uh, anecdote. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking actually even further back from that. I'm thinking like when we have the kids and they are, they're introduced and they're first learning their letters. Yeah. When, we, when you teach, say a student who, who knows not, doesn't know their alphabet at all yet, mm -hmm. you teach the alphabet first and the sounds of well, the alphabet. They have to learn the alphabet. Yeah. Absolutely. You, and they have, they, they actually need to know the alphabet song because the alphabet has an order. Um, and you need to know the vowel letters. But the point is, 
they do come in knowing morphology in their oral language or they wouldn't be speaking. Kids say rund, not because they've heard lots of people saying rund, but because they've worked it out. If I put a d at the end of that, it should mean the past tense, but it turns out that's not the standard, rund doesn't have the standard past tense. So then you, they've already aware of these things in their oral language. We're just bringing it to the orthography so I can talk about morphology without letters. We can but talk about- we, so, But when we get to that ABC part, like when they're, they're learning their yeah. ABCs, do you teach the, the sounds that the letters make at the same time, or do you teach that as a separate well, time? The alphabet is the names of the letters. The alphabet is, the letters don't write the sounds, the graphemes do. And so we need to know what are letter names, and we need to know that letters can be used as, the, they're, as they're the raw material that we use for graphemes. The letter T can be used as a single letter grapheme T, like in talk and pat, but the T isn't representing anything in the word the because it's part of a TH. So we have to make sure we understand the difference between what letters and what are graphemes. And when we sing the alphabet song, we don't stop at every letter and say how it sounds. We go A, B, C, D, right? We just say the letters. Well, I also announce the grapheme. So because we need to know what, not only do, if we want to teach what the grapheme phonic correspondence are, we better be naming the graphemes. So when we spell the word the, we should not spell it one letter at a time because that does not reveal the graphemes in the word the. And so we do it from the start. Now, so, and a great place to start from day one is kids' names. They, if they know one word, it's how to write their name. And if they don't know how to write their name, you spell it for them. If their name is Charlie, you get to teach them a CH. If their name is Jack, you get to teach them an a, a CK. And, and, and if you have a classroom of names and, the, and pr proper nouns don't necessarily follow English orthographic conventions, but you can talk about that too. Um, but we, we start with words the kids are interested in and then we can build from there. If you watch that video of the rain video with Carolee teaching a preschool class, the kids, some of them can read, most of them can't, but you can talk to a gra group of kids and say, hey, it's been a drought, but now it, there's rain today, isn't that great? Oh, it was raining. And, they can, and then they can toss out words like rains, which they do, and raincoat. And we, they can do that in their oral language. They can talk about morphology in their oral language. So I do not understand why we would have to hold that oral conversation off before we even talk about graphing phonic correspondences. And then we can talk, if they, some kid comes to your class, they don't know their alphabet yet, I got to teach them the alphabet, absolutely. One of the ways to learn letter names is because they're going to be spelling out loud in my class all the time. Yeah. So, okay, let's say uh, a kid, and I, I just really want to understand this, this, yep. this early part, just so I have a grasp on it. So let's say we have a, a students, they learn the alphabet. What does the next lesson look like? They know all the letter names. They don't know anything else. They don't know a single word or how to read a single word. Where do you start? Do you start with, because it, it, it sounds like you use a lot of text examples. But do you do you start with individual words, or are you going to throw a sentence at them and say, okay, like I mean, I mean, I'm going to look at individual words, but they would likely come from a context, right? Okay. So I've I've done this one before, and people get confused by it. But um, let me try it again. Um, so let's just say I have this silly sentence: "I love my cat." Okay. Now my kid can't read yet. Yeah. Just learning letter names. I read it to them. I love my cat. Do you have a cat at home? We just have a little conversation. Oh, that furry thing that purrs. We know what a cat is. Okay. Say cat for me. I'll cat. ask you to say, what do you feel at the beginning? K. Do you feel that k? And actually, it's not an uh there. It's not k at. It's a k. Can you go k? K. And try it. Here's the trick. Whisper it. There you go. When you whisper, you don't let your vocal cords vibrate. And there's not an uh, there's not a k phoneme, it's a k phoneme. And so you get the kid to do that. You feel your throat and you don't vibrate when you go k. And if I tell you to whisper, you know how to whisper. So you, whispering is by definition unvoiced. So you say k. How do you suppose you write the k in this word cat? And if they don't know, I say, oh, that's what the C does. The C can write k and that's what it's doing in cat. What do you feel at the end of cat? And you feel that t that we talked about before. Oh, I guess we write that with this final letter, the T, the grapheme T. Notice I just said letter and then I said grapheme. I'm starting to get them used to that language before we do anything too much about it. And say, well, what, say cat without the k, at, 
What do you feel the beginning of at? Ah, oh, that's written with the A. So I've just taught them the grapheme phonic correspondence of the C-A-T spells cat. But I want to, I want to show you something. My, my friend has 10 cats. Woo. Hey, can you spell this one for me? C-A-T. And spell this word for me. C-A-T-S. What's the difference? The difference is the S. And no why is there? Why do you suppose there's an S at the end of this one? Because he has ten cats. Oh, so I could say it would sound funny. I can't say I would. I have ten cat. That would sound silly. Preschoolers don't say that. Native English speaking don't say I have ten cat. They say cats. They just put this there, but they might not have had it drawn to their attention. So I make them draw it to their attention. Oh, we add an S, and and that's what I can. Okay, now let's move out of here. It turns out that every word you'll ever meet is either a base that we build on, and I can talk about the base of the microphone, the base in, in, out in the word we build up, but with words we build in front or after. So the base of this word is C-A-T. Say cat. Cat. And spell it. C-A-T. But then if I want to say more than one cat, I have to say cats, and I add that s. What, what do I put here, spell here, to write that s? Uh, S. That's right, right, right there. And what happens is then I rewrite those and I get C A T S. And I pause at that plus sign. So that S is there to say more than one. That's why I say cats. I can't say I have 10 cat. That would sound silly. But what if I had somebody who says, I love my dog? And I go through the phonology, d -oh -g, associate the graphemes and the phonemes. And then I say, my friend has 10 dogs. Say dog. Dog. Say dogs. Dogs. What did you fix at the end of dog to make it more than one dog? What did you say there? Z. You said z, didn't you? Put your hand on the throat and you feel yourself go z. You say cats and you're just saying s. You say dogs and you're going z. Well, that's interesting. Why do you suppose I have that S there? I still have my base, D-O-G, and I want to add more than one. I put that S, so I have D-O-G-S, but it turns out this is something we need to know, and that is, excuse me for one second, that there's something we need to know, and that is, graphemes, these letters, they can often write more than one pronunciation. The S, it turns out, can write S and Z. There's another grapheme you'll run into. The letter Z is used for that grapheme. It can write Z as well, like in zoo and zebra and such. But actually, we often find that we write the Z with an S. But how am I supposed to know to use an S, not a Z? Well, I've got to tell you something. There is an S suffix, but there's never a Z suffix. So if you're adding s or z to make a word more than one, we're always going to use the s. And I've just taught you names of letters, graphing phone and correspondences. We could now practice the s writing s and z in all sorts of places. I have an activity like that here, actually. Um, I think you're running dangerously low on your battery, sir. You, you're right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop and find power. And then can we rejoin? Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you what. I will end this um, recording because I think we're at an hour and a half, which is typically longer than I do for any interview. It's going to be the longest interview I've ever done, actually. And uh, I'm terrible. <laughs> I'll call this part one. Okay. And then next part, we can just finish that off and go to the research, and that won't take so long. Okay. Sounds great. All right. So I'll go back to the same meeting in in as soon as I get power. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> Thanks. Later.